Your Excellency, Madam Ambassador, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Tonight's talk by Mr. John Silva is on the Boxer Codex, a 16th century Spanish document created in the Philippines, transmitted to Spain, and subsequently found in the possession of Lord Chester, London. Also known as the Manila Manuscript, it is named after Charles Boxer, a British Army officer and historian who purchased the manuscript at an auction in 1947 from the estate of Lord Ilchester, whose mansion or house suffered a direct hit during an air raid in 1940. The Boxer Codex is now housed at the Lilly Library of Indiana University in Bloomington, USA. Two contemporary scholars, George Souza and Jeffrey Turley, are responsible for the first complete transcription and English translation of the Boxer Codex with a comprehensive introduction, a glossary of Spanish, Portuguese, Chinese, Malay and Tagalog terms, extensive footnotes and critical annotations of all its illustrations. After digitization, the Lily Library uploaded the box of codex on the internet and since 2009 it has been universally available to researchers. It provides evidence for understanding early modern geography, but also the ethnography and history of sections of the Western Pacific, as well as the major segments of maritime and continental Southeast Asia and East Asia. Tonight, this fascinating tale will be recounted by Mr. John Silva, Executive Director of the Ortigas Library, a Manila-based private collection open to the general public. To his care is entrusted a large collection of rare books, maps, prints, and vintage photographs of the Philippines. Mr. Silva is a published author and contributes to various Philippine and international publications on history and culture. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, you're welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I just wanted to give a, a very brief uh, explanation about your previous library. Uh, the library is a, it's a private library. It was founded by Mr. Rafael Ortigas, a businessman who collected Philippine material for researchers to re-examine our history and to write in a contemporary and objective Filipino point of view. The library has over 23,000 volumes of books, rare maps, prints, photographs, and ephemera, Spanish, Spanish, Spanish Filipino, Filipino American, and current <coughs> We have lectures uh, every month or so, movie showings and conservation workshops at the library. We have an outreach program. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, we collect all these books and then we send them off to the various uh, libraries in the country that need it. This one was a penal colony uh, that wanted to set up library, so we made sure we came up a lot of books. This is the current side of the found out that 70% of the, of the uh, isn't prisoners were illiterate. And so when I, when I was leaving the library, I could hear all of this buzz and talking, and it turns out that the, those who were illiterate were reading the books to those that were illiterate. In 2013, I curated an exhibition held at the Dusitani uh, Hotel in Manila, commemorating the 50th anniversary of the 1963 visit of the King and Queen of Thailand. I had access to the Royal Library here in Bangkok, and with our own library collection, we showed Filipino audience the trade and relations the two countries have had since pre-Spanish times. The 
with evidence like the so-called jars that are found in our cities. This evidence of a Siamese trading ship uh, that went to the Philippines in that time. The king, when he was in uh, Manila, about a week ago, was generous in his praises with the Filipino people. One example was a quote he said in a welcome address in Manila Airport. He said, we are overwhelmed by the warmth of this welcome. You can even feel that we are not in a foreign land. It has been said that the Filipinos are the ties of the Nordic than any other peoples in Asia, and they may have been brothers once upon a time. I have a personal fondness for Thailand and come here several times a year for the past 20 years. This fascinating book, a recent printing entitled The Boxer Codex and published by the Bibal Foundation in the Philippines, has contents that connects the two countries. And I'm happy to be able to come back tonight, get together to Thailand, and share this book with you. This is the sheepskin, uh, sheepskin cover of the book. This is originally just a manuscript. The Boxer Codex, a 380 page illuminated manuscript on sturdy rice paper, which includes close to 100 illustrations of the people and animals in the Marianas, the Philippines, Borneo, Malukas, Java, Sumatra, Malaysia, Vietnam, Cambodia, China, and Japan. The written accounts of the various kingdoms and groupings by Portuguese and Spanish adventurers, soldiers, clergy, and officials were gathered in the late 16th century and with the illustrations done by a local Chinese artist. And, my, and the manuscript was sent to the Royal Court of Madrid in 1605. Just a 
bag of peppers in one hand made one very, very good. <coughs> the emboldened Portuguese conquered Malacca in 1511, and Duarte Fernandez, a tailor turned diplomat and explorer, made his way north and was the first European to reach Siam. He was welcomed by Ramathi Wadi too, and on his way back to Malacca, was accompanied by a Siamese envoy bearing gifts and letters for the Portuguese king. The newly found route to the Indies and its financial return would capture the imagination of so many other adventurers and ship pilots, most particularly for the man Magellan. There was a problem though, a very big one. For the Spaniards, it was the demarcation line called the Treaty of Tormesillas, which in 1494, Pope Alexander VI arbitrarily divided up the world with anything west being Spain's uh, to conquer, and Portugal gets the east. The Pope would give weight to this declaration by calling it a papal bull, meaning that God gave him the authority to divide the world. The Spaniards would have a way, would have to find a way in these Portuguese. Magellan, who had been in the Malucas years before during the eastern route, was able to persuade Emperor Charles to fund five ships and 270 men uh, and, and, and promised him that, he, that there was a route he knew to get to the Indies. So off Magellan went and his crew on a grueling 17 month, 17 months journey, finding the southern straits that linked the Atlantic and Pacific and sailed on till reaching their first island, Guam. Which I told you earlier was given the name Ladrones. The crew reaches Cebu, Philippines, in April 1521, and for the Pig Feta account, Magellan would, in arrogant colonial behavior, demand from the natives to accept the Catholic God and fealty to the king. Roger Humabo became the king of Cebu and his wife were baptized. And so this is a very classical uh, uh, painting by uh, Fernando Mursola, a national artist. Uh, sort of a very dreamlike uh, uh, thing of, uh, of the Baptist. Meanwhile, Magellan sets off to confront the warrior Lampulapo on the nearby island of Magda to demand the same thing from him. Lampulapo will have none of that and fights and kills Magellan. The surviving crew returns to Cebu, and Humabo is told of a treacherous plan to take over Cebu. So what he did was he invited some of the crew to dinner and had 30 of them killed afterwards. This is the same guy who just got baptized <laughs> but he took several weeks ago and, and sort of showed his fealty to the king. Only eight, 18 crew members of the 270 returned to Spain almost three years after they left. I'm always curious the way uh, it's depicted, the, the killing of Magellan, and that is that the tendency is to show pity uh, or worry for Magellan rather than the fact that the Spaniard and the Filipinos fought the defender, fought the defenders. They're always surrounded. They're about to be killed. This is the Victoria, the last ship, uh, the only ship that made it to uh, Sydney three years after. Losing Magellan and having a skeleton crew return to Spain gave Emperor Charles Pause. He abandoned the islands, agreeing to a new treaty, the Treaty of Saragossa, with Portugal, putting the Philippines in the Portuguese side of the demarcation line for a sum of money. He needed a lot of money. He was always in debt. I was always trying to find a 
good picture of Charles and Edward Philip, but they always wore this thing called the card piece, which, uh, which is supposed to show their virility. <coughs> so there it is. So here's Philip, also in the same problem. Rather disturbing. Philip II, Emperor Charles V's son, reigned from 1556 to 1598, a period of expansion and consolidation for this Spanish empire. When Philip became king, and you must remember he wasn't just king, it turns out, not just of Spain, he was also king of the Italian kingdoms of Valencia, Naples, the two Sicilies, Tuscany, the Medellese, and the Juria, and almost all of Italy. He would inherit further from his father, the house of Burgundy, Flanders, and King Lord of Holland and the Netherlands. When his father married him off to Mary Tudor, daughter of the English King Henry VIII, Philip would be, until the death of Mary, the rightful king of England. He was the master of the Americas, and later, in 1581, as heir to his Portuguese mother, Isabel, Philip met in 1581 annexed Portugal and became king as well of Portugal's colonies in South America, Africa, India, and the Middle East. So it's a very substantial, you can therefore get a sense of what Philip must have thought of, of himself in terms of ruling basically the world. But Philip knew that there was one set of islands missing in his empire. When he was still prince, uh, when, he was, when he was still prince, the islands were named after him, Philippines. As king, when he became king, he disregarded his father's adherence to the Treaty of Zaragoza. In 1565, he sent a fleet to reconquer and colonize the Philippines. As a devout Catholic, he wanted his faith to spread to the new lands and did not overlook the Philippines. When his council for the Indies urged him to give up such a remote and worthless possession of the Philippines, who didn't have that much uh, uh, peppers and spices, the king replied, if the income of the islands were not enough to support one hermit, and if there were only one person there to keep the name and veneration of Jesus Christ alive, I would send missionaries from Spain to spread this gospel. Looking for mines of precious metals is not the only business of kings. King Magus I was about 25 years younger than Philip II, but ruled about the same time period, the latter part of the 16th century. Magus I is revered for his having declared independence from the Burmese, Tangu, Empire, and defeating many attempts to thereafter to enslave Siamese. He rallied his forces successfully against rebellions local or externally and achieved a relative peace for four years in his kingdom. A feat, considering the internecine conflicts Siam got into with Burma and other neighboring. Both the Spaniards and Portuguese had little understanding or empathy for Siamese culture and religion, or for that matter, the religion and culture of the Asian, of the Asian peoples. The Spaniards, having vanquished their sworn enemies, the Moors and the Jews from the Iberian Peninsula, just 70 years earlier, knew the basics of Islam and were wary of the minority Muslim population in Siam and the rest of they were wary too of the presence of Muslims in parts of the Philippines. So that when they colonized Manila in 1571, the Spaniards had to fight the local Raja, put him and his fortress to rout, burn their settlements before making Manila a colonial capital. The Iberians were baffled by Buddhism and Hindu practices, which they characterized as heathen. They invented tales and chronicles of them about their beliefs and much of it apostles. One such thing was that Siam was founded from the union between a woman and a dog. 
Since any religion other than Christianity was suspect of the Iberians and branded pagan, there was no meeting of the minds on this point. Much of the prevailing interest for Sidon and the adjoining kingdoms were the riches and treasures they could provide. From its kingdom and surrounding areas, they offered copper, quicksilver, vermilion, cloth, silk, saffron, opium, threaded white coral, and from Mecca, all the way from Mecca, printed velvets and rose wine. There was also silver and gold and ivory and benzoin and brazil wood and the skins of deer, tigers, and other animals, and large quantities of cheap cloth, some of these coming through from China and Bangladesh. Spain and Portugal would in return give Sion, as well as the rest of Asia for that matter, crops from their American colonies by way of the galleon ships that fly the Pacific between Acapulco and Manila. Portugal would provide the same for the Brazilian colony. Chili peppers, corn, tomatoes, potatoes, sweet and white, peanuts, papaya, and more in, and were and were indigenous to Americas were able to spread throughout the due to Spanish and Portuguese colonialism. High cuisine would be so different if chili peppers weren't introduced. It is the late 16th century. There's one last historical context to present about the of Rubens. It is the late 16th century. Philip II's in Spain and Portugal dominated much of the globe. Both were bearing down in Asia, the last continent that was not colonized. Uh, the Portuguese had settled down, and also the Spanish, and are comfortable with their environment and beginning to think expansively. Uh, they wanted to secure the spice trade. They wanted to monopolize it because they were being muzzled in by Muslim, Indian, and the occasional Dutch traders. For the Spanish, the gallon trade was clearly remunerative for many. Chinese silks, porcelain, ivory, and lacquerware were very much in demand in the New World and in Europe. So if one could profit immensely by just one trip of the gallon, why not go to the source? Why not go to, why not get the source? Visions of expanding the empire danced in many colonial heads. The plotters needed to persuade the king of Spain to give his full support. Here's my theory. The plotters thought about what the king fancied. He was not known for extravagance leading a very austere life. The Escorial may have been a large castle built outside of Madrid it was massive yet unadorned. There was a dower looking basilica inside and a monastery was included in the building plan. To allow King Philip to participate in the daily monastic activities. But one section of the castle would stand out very differently, sumptuously decorated, and filled with books, manuscripts, and maps. King Philip was a voracious collector, and the Escorial Library was considered the best there and most extensive in both written and manuscript antiquities. The plotters found this this weakness. And so the plan to have as a gift to the king an illuminated manuscript over 300 pages on sturdy rice paper with exquisite illustrated insects featuring the peoples of Asia, this gift would sure, surely win over a learned king, a bibliophile. There would be this ultimate satisfaction of having such a manuscript be the first of its kind in any European island. A variety of soldiers, a writers for the Codex, soldiers, adventurers, chroniclers, and priests contributed to or were recruited to cover the various countries. Their speculation that the compiler and editor of the Codex was the lawyer Antonio de Morga, who wrote the success of the Islas de Divinas, which is an important early work.
to the Chinese architect, or art, artist, Ken Yong, or Juan de Vera, that was his Christian name. A Christian convert who was responsible for the first book printed in 1593 in the Philippines, entitled La Doctrina Cristiana. He most probably lived and worked in the Parian or the Chinatown section of Manila. The only existing copy of this Doctrina Cristiana is in the Library of Congress. And the same copy, that same copy was first gifted to Philip II. And then somewhere along the way, winds up with a Parisian bookseller, and then resold to an American dealer, and who in turn sold it to the Library of Congress. The greatest number of illustrations, of native illustrations in the Codex, were those of the various tribes in Strata of the Philippines. They are intricate and gilded in gold, one, and one can glean the familiarity the Parian Chinese artists had with the native Filipinos in contrast to the other Asian subjects that seemed less indulgent. In the book, in the Codex, China had the most chapters and illustrations. Aside from the people of the Ming, Ming Dynasty, it included Chinese birds, animals, and monsters. The most vivid to me of all the illustrations is this fold out of the arrival of a gallery in the Ladrones Islands in 1590. One sees the gallery of Capitana uh, having just made the long voyage in the Pacific and arriving there in the islands. The natives on the outrigger seem eager to share the fish, fruits, and gourds, probably filled with tuba or coconut wine. The men on the ship are eager to secure them as well. Other beautiful illustrations in the codex include a ladrones, chamorro male warrior, design pintados, or designs who, who did uh, uh, tattooing, a bejeweled Moroccan woman, and there were 22 written sections in the codex. Most of them were anonymous, but three accounts were by Joao de Vero a very interesting man, the Bishop of Malacca. The account of the Maluku Islands in New Guinea is by the Portuguese adventurer Miguel Rojo de Brito, while the long narrative on China is by Martin de Rada, an Augustinian we have no picture of the uh, bishop of Malacca, so I just put it in an old, old church in Malacca, in St. Paul's. Uh, this is by Rojo de Vita, and, uh, and this is Martin de Rada, an Augustinian friar who was one of the first missionaries to the Philippines and the first missionary to reach China in the main period. The writing quality of the pieces were dependent on the writer's backgrounds and interests. Most of them start off with a geographical rendering. How many leagues away was it? How many fathoms wide? A distance equal to one shot of an archivist? How many days walk? The physical terrain and other location descriptions, <coughs> all before the advent of Google Maps. <laughs> if there is much description, If there's much description of the bay uh, or any locals present, the width of a river and friendly villages by the bay, one can suspect the writer may have been a ship captain or a pilot. If the passages, if the chapter seems to be peppered with findings and looking for gold and looking for silver and precious stones, one can tell, one can suspect, that the writer was an adventurer and has journeyed to this part of the world to strike the rich. Some accounts are quite quizzical to me. There's one on China that goes on and on and on for several pages about the kind of hats worn by the nobility and the peasant, whether it is square-shaped or oval, how their hair is worn and decorated. It is as if the reader had an utter fascination with hair and hats and has now provided us with so much trivia about them. There are no literary passages, no moments of ecstasy of the new sights that we hold them. 
sunsets, the beauty of a native smile. Instead, they focused on the unusual, the shocking culture of the Japanese source and committing suicide to achieve equanimity, or the alleged cannibalism, or the use of a sex toy, the debauchery, everything except the humanity of the people around them. Here's one page that I found so interesting. The one on the upper left is a penis ring drawn there, worn by the designers in the Philippines. The penis, this ring, is inserted into the penis just in the, at the tip, and then there's a, a, a pin that goes through the penis, and it's supposed to be it excites the sexual, the sexual act. Lots of penis rings. I remember when I was in the National Museum, his penis rings were on the spray, but it was like on the side. <laughs> like nobody wanted to deal with it. Nobody wanted to talk with it. I'm not annotated, it's not described, nothing. You know, but there it was, the penis rings. But what I find very one is, why would you present a penis spirit to a king? <laughs> We're supposed to persuade him to invade. Him. You know, I'm not sure they have penis spirit, but who knows? <laughs> it would be several centuries later when a handful of enlightened Europeans, keen on breaking out of their supremacist culture, would travel to the East, to Africa, to Asia, to write or even paint more accurately and sympathetically of its inhabitants and recognize their sensuality. But that's several centuries later. There were three principles, principles meaning sort of the, the plotters in the right wing preparing the box of codex. And they were Bishop Rivera Valle of Malacca, which I don't have a picture of, except for St. Paul's Church. And then the Philippine Governor General's Gomez, Gomez Las Marinas and his son, Governor Luis Perez Las Marinas. That's Governor, oops, that's Governor Luis Perez Las Marinas. Of the three of them, Bishop Gallo Malaca was the most gung-ho in expanding Iberian domination, and he expounds on it in his description of taking over Pache if the king of Spain sends him 4,000 men. Promises to the king of enormous wealth was reiterated over and over again. The part that I think is very interesting for us Philippines is for the longest part, we only knew about the Philippine section until these new publications came up, which has complete transcription and, and uh, translation. And, and the last part is an addendum. There are like four letters. These are the most revealing and the most compelling reasons invoking wealth and the name of the Christian God as the most unassailable verdict for the invasion of Sinai. Bishop Dario would write this thing to The East Indies, ruled by Viceroy of Sinai and Goa, begins in Mozambique. India to Sri Lanka, Bengal, Sumatra, and Bodhi. But there are spices, silver, and all the treasures in Japan, China, Cochinchina, Siam, and Champa. We need a conquistador to give our Lord many victories. Another by Bishop Gaio, two governor of Luis Perez and Carinas in the Philippines. He says, the kingdom of Siam is a great enemy of the Christians and of the name of Jesus and his holy cross. Their king has become very powerful, menacing, arrogant, and cruel, and is very important for the service of God and for his majesty and for the good of these states. It should be destroyed with a notable punishment. They weren't missing their words. <laughs> Lastly, Governor Luis Perez Las Marinas letter to the king. The conquest of Siam is most advised both for the service of God and for your majesty. So much can be gained in these kingdoms, so rich, an abundance of supplies and precious stones. The king of Siam is best known and feared by all for his arrogance, 
and unheard of cruel punishments. Siam is the most wicked mother house of our daughters. There is no spoiler alert in this presentation. <laughs> if we know our history, we know Siam has not been made due to the Codex. The Codex's intention was not carried out. There were important factors as to why it never saw fruition. Much of the manuscript was gathered with text and illustrations ready in 1598. The manuscript have been sent to Spain through Hernando de los Rios in 1605. But King Philip, the person who decided on an invasion, dies in 1598, just when the manuscript was finished in Manila. His son, Philip II, succeeds him, but is embroiled with corruption and faced enormous debt which does not allow him to think about an invasion. Governor Luis Perez de Sparinas, a man on the left, being counseled by, by Friar, ended his term up to the 1596, and without the power of governorship and the death of Philip II, he decides a plan to invade Cambodia without any success. De Sparinas was killed in Manila during the 16th of Chinese revolt. The father, Governor Perez de Sparinas, was killed in a mutiny on board his ship by Chinese rowers in 1593. They were bound for Ternate to invade the battle. Bishop Gaia, who was well advanced in age, was returning to Portugal in 1598 via Goa. In Goa, he demanded a lot of money for service to render and was becoming a pest to the wise ones. The wise are called him impertinent. He dies in 1609. Under the new Spanish governor general, Don Francisco Delgado, he secures the Treaty of Amity and Commerce to King Matt after, the, after all this past decade of Spanish and Portuguese skirmishes with Sierra, and probably to end the hawkish administration of the Spaniards. I end my narration of the Boxer Codex, hoping you will be interested in reading it, since there are still many chapters I did not review, and instead went to an important stage in until this complete transcription and translation of the Boxer Codex occurred in 2016, there was no one who knew about a planned invasion of Siam using a beautiful, illuminated manuscript meant to entice a king who was a brilliant man. As me, heading a private library whose strength is in Philippine history, I consider the Boxer Codex as yet another example of how history could be, could have possibly changed the world. But I also think that if the Spaniards tried, King Nellis was very, very far. How did the Boxer Codex get moved from the Royal Library in Madrid, of its Ellis Royale to England, to the library of the Earl of Ilchester? later to be auctioned and won by Charles Boxer. That's another evening to talk about. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.
Dragon Fisher. Since he was in the Malacas and thus in Portuguese controlled territory, wouldn't him asking the Spanish to invade and conquer an area run against the interest of his home home nation? I, I, I said that what happened was in 1581, uh, Portugal was annexed by uh, Spain because of the Queen Isabella. And so they became the Iberian Empire, as I call it that. And so he had the right to ask the Spanish to do whatever he did. And when did they come I think it was sometime in the 16th, somewhere later on in the 16th century. I'm not sure. I mean, seven kids. The codex has been published online. Yes. Um, are there, is, is the online version just photographs of the pages and no, no, no translation? No, yes. The online is just no translation. It's, it's exactly as it is. So it is in Spanish. Old Spanish and then the trans and then the illustrations. So I can get beautiful illustrations there. Absolutely. That's how I have a beautiful lecture. It's because I just downloaded it from the Lily Temple collection. Yes, and 
Considering that it survived the bombing, uh, the Nazi bombing, uh, that house was bombed by the Nazis in the world. Okay. <laughs> Some of the remarks, of course, were outrageous and racist. 